And next up, we'll examine where patients fit into the health data equation. How will the information explosion change the everyday rhythms of patients, their doctors, and their hospitals? And we have just the people to tackle these issues with us today. So I'd like to introduce to the stage our next panelists. Principal of Vivify, Leonard Kish. Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the Executive Office of the President, Ryan Pad Chad Saram, Director of Sinai App Lab and Chief Technology Innovation and Engagement Officer of Mount Sinai Medical Center, Ashish Atreja, and Director, Director rather, of Health Insurance and Coverage of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Catherine Hempstead. And here to lead the conversation is my colleague, the Atlantic's contributing editor, Mary Louise Kelly. So Mary Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. We've just thoroughly confused you by coming in in the wrong order. So <laughs> your first assignment is trying to figure out who's who. Um, speaking for myself, I am delighted to report that no one has mistaken me for Jerry Springer on the streets of New York <laughs> yet this morning. The day is young, um, although I, I heard in the earlier panel you were, they were asking about personal devices. If you want to share any during the Q&A, we are game, so, so bring it on. Um, we've been hearing already this morning about how all of the changes in technology are making it easier and easier and easier to collect tons of data, however, figuring out what we do with all that data and who owns all that data is not getting any easier. So we're going to spend this conversation focused on the presumed goal of accumulating all this data, which is helping the patient. And I say the presumed goal because that often gets lost. Um, I want to kick us off with my, uh, a quote from my friend and colleague Jim Fallows, uh, who writes for The Atlantic. He wrote an article recently about medical data, and the lead was these two sentences, which are telling. As more of medicine comes into the information age, will we get better faster? Or will we simply have a more detailed idea of why we're sick? Which is a pretty succinct way of, of summing up the challenge. So here to tackle that and some of the other questions, thanks to all four of you. And I want to open by letting you all weigh in just on a, a broad question, because I'm curious where you'll take it. In the broadest sense, what difference will better information technology make in our lives, in our health? And let me start. This is Leonard here, right next to me. Let me start with you, Leonard Kiss. Well, I think part of it, uh, I think Robert Johnson has a statistic that 80% of outcomes are not driven by things that happen in the clinic. They're driven by th you know, the choices that we make day in and day out. And I think the real impact is there. Um, when, when we have kind of this, I call it the meta me, the, the kind of data version of myself, mm. I can make much better decisions about you know, how, how I can not get sick in the first place as opposed to you know, once it, I get into the clinic or the hospital and it's too late. So I think that for me is really the big opportunity. The other part of it I think is costs. Um, higher deductibles, everybody's on the hook. Um, for more and more of their own health care expenses. So I think in order, in order to take steps and understand our own health better, we need to have access to that data. We need to have access to the, to the meta-me in order to alleviate some of those costs. Okay. Ryan, where do you sit? You're with the federal government, our deputy chief technology officer. Where, where do you come down on the meta-me question? And <laughs> is how it's going to help us out? Yeah, I think this one here, it's, like it's incredibly empowering, right? Empowering for patients, but also empowering for all the innovators as well, too. I think there's a lot of fog when it comes to healthcare and the information that happens, right? For most people who participate in the system, you don't know what's happening behind the walls. And by getting access to that information, it puts you in more control. And so to the quote that you shared a bit earlier, I think it's a bit of both worlds, right? You get a detailed understanding of what's wrong, but at the same token, too, it opens up a lot of opportunities. And so on the patient side, it's incredibly empowering. But for the innovators as well, I think there are a lot of people who want to improve the healthcare system, and the missing link has been the data. And by having the data, you get to start to create better apps and services and technologies and start to do really neat things with it. And so I would say empowerment is like the key piece there. Okay. Catherine. Yeah, I would say, you know, societally, we're seeing a big transfer of information from medical professionals to regular people. And just as the other panelists have said, I think it gives people so much more of an opportunity to find out what they can do to stay healthy and how they can take care of their health. And so much of that has to do with things that happen outside the healthcare system. I think one of our challenges is to see how can we 
disseminate those benefits as broadly through society as possible. I think mm -hmm. that's that's always been, you know, one of one of our biggest challenges. And sometimes when we get new information that allows people to be healthier, it can in the short run widen disparities because some people will take more advantage of that information more quickly than other people. I think the other thing that this, you know, real um, increase in information allows us to uh, to do is find out more quickly when we're making mistakes and, and improve things faster because we have so much better opportunity to observe the results of different things that we're doing. So just short circuiting the feedback. Loop that's that's a little the bit. hope. We have a panel yeah. that you may have noticed is somewhat stacked in terms of feeling optimistic <laughs> about all of these <laughs> changes and empowering the patient and all of that, which it does raise some serious questions. The, the previous panel was just starting to kick around some of the privacy implications that all of this raises, and, and, and I want to make sure that we get to that. But first, Ashish, let me let you weigh in uh, from your perch at Mount Sinai. On Absolutely. That. So as, as a provider and a, and a technology innovation officer and engagement officer um, and, a, and a caregiver, uh, I would say data is useful to me if it is tied to action. Okay. If it allows me to take the right action at the right time, then it is valuable, at least as a person who's going to lead to some outcomes improvement. Now, most of the time when we talk about data, we talk about computational scientists who want to do predictions and other stuff, but I think where rubber meets the road is leading it to action. Um, and, and for that, I think the data has to be the right kind of data in the right format available to the right person, whether it's a patient or a physician or other caregiver, at the right time. And I think many times we talk about all this innovative way, new data can be captured, devices and other things, but we don't talk about delivery science, how this data lead to the people who are gonna lead to action. And because that's probably not very sexy, that's not probably very, you know, that's been going on for such a long time, psychosocial behavioral determinants of health and other kind of data. So we don't do that good a job in bringing, using the data that's new kind of data being collected to making it available for actions. We'll stay with that for a minute. Um, let, let's start with the sexy part of this and, and how, you know, get us fired up about the possibilities here. You're at Sinai, um, the, the app lab at Mount Sinai. You have something I was just starting to ask you about right before we came out uh, called Health Promise. This is an in-house app that's just launched about six months ago. Tell us what it is and is it helping patients yet? That's, that's correct. So we, we have a 10 people innovation team and the goal was we didn't want data to be just logged with any new technologies outside the Sinai. We really wanted to bring a full innovation mobile development here so we can better use the data connected with electronic medical record. So Health Promises our endeavor uh, to make a disease agnostic app uh, which captures patient reported outcomes, NIH promise measures and not only gives the feedback back to patients, but also gives all the data to physicians at the point of care, and also when they're not seeing the patients. And I typically say that I practice inflammatory bowel disease patients who are chronically diseased, um, and I see them maybe two to three times a year max. But really the opportunity to make the maximum improvement is when they are at home or at work, because that's where the symptoms start. And if I can find, get to know at that point, my medicines are much more effective. So how does that actually work? I, I'm a patient. I check into Mount Sinai. I, I download this app onto my phone. That is correct. Everything that you, as my physician, are taking note of and as test results come in, et cetera, that's going automatically into the app where I can see it? Is that? So there's another app for that, yes. Okay. And this app is where we will disclose all the best quality metrics you have okay. for your disease. So many times patients see doctors are typing about checklists. And they say, what is that? We, are, we have made all the best practices for our care available to patients so they can learn about it. And then they track their symptoms continuously. So every week or every two weeks. And all this data comes back to us, but in a visualization format so we can immediately know the patients who are falling through the cracks. And then there's a population health coordinator who actually reaches out to the patient. So and when you say what's useful to you as a physician is seeing what's happening when I'm not in the hospital after I've gone home and, and been on my own for four months, does that require me to enter things into the app? It's self-reporting, in other words? It's, it's patients who is entering mostly. Okay. And physicians are just seeing it. And physicians have a way to see the data, the most important data which they need, um, and just um, send a message to the patients to be able to come back for a phone call, or a telemedicine visit or an office visit. So it's directly tied to action, uh, but a lot of the stuff has been done in visualization of the data, so physicians or the population health coordinator can find the right patient to be engaged with at okay. the moment they need. Leonard. Yeah, I'd like to comment on, on the action part. Um, we work with a telemedicine company, um, name is SiriusMD, and what they, 
the freedom, one of the doctors who founded the company says, is that when you look at telemedicine and you, can, you have access to the system 24-7, um, it frees the physician from having to make a decision a lot of times. So they talk about, you know, it has to be make a decision, but sometimes the best decision is no decision. And so when you start looking at someone longitudinally over a period of time, it's much easier to say, well, you know, to, to go back to the, you know, have two aspirin, call me in the morning, which is, you right. know, no longer valid because you can't call the doctor and it might be two months to your next appointment. <laughs> um, but th I think that freedom um, to see that longitudinal perspective is incredibly freeing and I think it will also help reduce costs and improve quality okay. over time. Catherine, I know you're playing a little bit in this field as well, in addition to your work trying to keep up with all of the massive changes going on in, in insurance markets. You're also working with software app developers trying to figure out things, little tweaks that can be made that can actually help real people. Tell me some of the most promising things you're yeah, seeing. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, I think a lot of people in the foundation are very interested in sort of the whole patient experience and, and you know, do a lot of work that has a lot to do with what some of the panelists are talking about. I think my, my own concentration is a little bit further upstream is mm -hmm. when people are actually choosing a health plan. And mm -hmm. I think the, you know, the ACA and the opening up of this market, I think, has really been such a great thing for sort of health data in general and just sort of consumerism in healthcare and trying to uh, give people the information that they need to make a, you know, apples to apples comparison between all these different health plans. And, and with the way plans are increasingly structured with both the high deductible and also uh, like a narrow choice of provider networks, there's really so much bundled into this decision. When you're choosing your health plan, you're choosing so much. So there's so many different features of the product that consumers need to know about. And so we have been encouraging the tech industry and um, just really stunned by how quickly things are happening and working a lot with the government too and sponsoring these apps challenges where people are attacking kind of different pain points in the plan choice process. So one of them is the ability to be able to enter some information about yourself and then simulate sort of what would what would it cost me in at the end of a year to be in this plan versus that plan because so much more than the premiums at stake really in, in calculating all those costs. So the, the out-of-pocket cost calculator is a huge thing. And then another thing we just wrapped up a challenge on is the um, provider directory search because so many uh, people want to know if a certain Dr. X is in their plan or not, and it's been quite inconvenient until recently, and you know, I think we're going to see some really great things that healthcare.gov is going to do this year, and that just the, the speed of adoption of these improved consumer decision support tools, are, it's, I'm really just overwhelmed by, by how, how quickly it's happened. Not that you know, every single thing is solved, and people that live in some states by fortune or misfortune are going to have better consumer decision support than people that live in other states just because of the way their markets are organized. But I think that um, it's, it's been really gratifying to see how innovative and um, excited and creative industry has been and been you know, really um, leaping up to attack these different challenges. You mentioned the word overwhelmed, and you were using it in a positive sense about all the, the many cool new things happening in this space. I have to say, as a, as a patient, I feel a little bit overwhelmed by all of the choices. The, the number got thrown around by my colleague Steve Clemens in the earlier panel. He says there's something like 250,000 new medical and healthcare apps out, you know, in some stage of development or on the market. I don't know where he came up with that number, but it's out there, so we'll go with it. It's official. That's kind of exhausting in a way as the consumer trying to sort through all of that. Is there some, you know, that's that's one downside, as I see it, of empowering the consumer of all this. And at a certain point, it's kind of nice to call your doctor and just hear him say, "Take two aspirin, call me in the morning." I, any reaction to that? Well, I think first, it's it's better than the converse. Yes. It's better too many than too, too much than information. Too few, is better but than I think too few. Okay. Uh, there's a great there's a book called the. Uh, information by James Glick and he talks about you know the kind of overabundance of information you know abroad, across the broad things but he, his point is that's always been a problem for every being you know on the planet since the dawn of time too much information how do you select that what's accurate and I think the same thing is going to play out in healthcare and we'll, we'll come up with better tools to figure out what's applicable mm -hmm. to what situations and what's not. I think right. folks are going to also choose like the 
tools that are investing deeper, right? Like two examples being like you think of all the companies that are building better sensors and the things that come along with them, right? These aren't just simple apps anymore. They're companies investing in hardware, companies investing in like machine learning and AI on top of it to do really big, meaningful things. And it's uh, really exciting to see that there's hundreds of those companies that exist, right? Because I think we've gone through iterative waves as the past, you know, seven, eight years have gone by as the iPhone existed to see folks evolve from, you know, simple apps to apps with devices and even companies taking even bigger leaps, right? Like look at PillPack, for example. They're a company that said, well, we're going to actually own the whole pharmacy and take your personal health data, in this case, your medications, and we're going to make that a better experience. And so while there's tons of options, and that's actually better than having less, it's neat to see that there are a lot of them that are diving deeper, taking more of the pie or problem, you could say, and more money being invested in them as well. I'd say like in the past four years, it's gone from, what, 500 million invested in the digital health now to like to over 2 billion each year. And so these are exciting things, and I will take the paradox of choice over like the lack of choice, like Leonard says. You were in private sector before you jumped over to the federal government yes. three years ago or yep. so. How different does that, that you know, how does that change your perspective <laughs> on, on all of these trends happening? Yeah, I, I think there's no, there's no industry better uh, to kind of represent the power of what the private sector and government can do together. I think Chris said it really well in the last panel, right? We push each other and we do it in a really mm -hmm. good way. You know, you look back at the consumer space, not health, consumer, and you're like, wow, a lot has happened in the consumer space in the past seven years, all these amazing innovations. And you look at health, you're like, hmm, we're not moving as fast. And that's true, but if you look at seven years ago and think, uh, actually even four years ago or three years ago, I could go to a room like this and say, are you able to get your health records online? And only maybe one out of 10 of you would raise your hand and say yes. If I ask that question right now, actually let me ask it right now, how many of you can go online right now to any of your providers or uh, health insurance companies to download a copy of your health records? And, and it was, see, so that, that, that's the next thing. It's like it is this iterative piece, right? Like in the past three years, we've accomplished this. So now we're on to the next wave. And so that next wave is doing more meaningful things with that data. And I've been able to see both sides. And really, it's this constant positive tension that happens, right? Meaningful Use 3 just got introduced last week. Like there's a beautiful fact sheet online which you can find out more. But these are the raising the bar for electronic health records, right? Now by either 27 or 2018, it's in there. An API is going to be one of the requirements of a health record. That's going to empower more of us to do more meaningful things. Like you were sharing some of the stuff you're doing at Mount Sinai. And they're working with Epic and using the API there to do some really cool things. But imagine if the whole industry could do that. And so my perspective I'm seeing is there is a really good, strong relationship between government and the private sector. It becomes healthier when there are forums like this and a lot of active participants as well because you meet some of the folks at the Department of Health and Human Services or at ONC, which is the Office of the National Coordinator, or at CMS. Like They are listening and they want to hear how they can make things better. You talked about the improvements of healthcare.gov. This is an iterative uh, I guess you could say battle to improve healthcare, but then there are also people coming out of left field doing these huge leaps as well, like with sensors and things like that. And so, okay, we push that. back Lots a little of, bit on yeah. some of that because we're we're moving now into what to me is such a key question: who owns all this data? Whether it's you know the Fitbit that's reporting whether you've taken yeah. your ten thousand steps today, or whether it's the CAT scan you just got done. Uh, you know, who owns this stuff? And Leonard, let me let me start with you because you have a kind of interesting personal story yeah. of your attempt to wrangle <laughs> a, a non-controversial piece of information out of a hospital. Tell what happened post-surgery. Well, a little backdrop first. Uh, um, I wrote an article called uh, "Unpatients: Why Patients Should Own Their Their Medical Data" that was in Nature Biotech last week, which explains kind of the vision behind this. But I think, well, you know, obviously, I think patients should own their information. Um, but first, we need to get access, and second, we need a place to put it. So we've worked on uh, Get My Health Data, um, getmyhealthdata.org, um, which is a website dedicated to kind of loosening all the processes that people need to go through to actually request their health record and then track through what we're calling the tracer study um, how uh, what those difficulties are and, and let people tell their stories about it. You've had like you know, a million people go and sign up and uh, try to I don't do think this. we've had quite a million, <laughs> but uh, uh, Nate uh, actually might be able to tell me more. But <laughs> okay. Right. You can weigh in during but, Q and A. I, I, just yeah. quickly, have you found, have you identified what the roadblocks are? You know, my own story that, that you alluded to, you know, I had surgery, an orthopedic surgery a couple years ago, and, uh, you know, I, I, something happened during surgery that I thought might be significant, and so I, I, filled out the form, I went online, I filled out the form, 
I faxed it in, and you know, just nothing. Crickets. Never heard a response. Never heard anything. And you know, I think that's that's a very common story. A lot of times we hear that um, you know it's rejected for this little reason. You know, the typical kind of red tape thing, or they send it back again with that fixed. And then there's another little reason why their request was rejected. And finally, they go to their physician and say, "Hey, can I have my record?" And they say, sure, and hand them a disk that's totally unencrypted, you know, has no security on, what, on it whatsoever with all their name and their birth date, and, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> and you never got the records? Uh, I never and did, but I've to talked you. to another doctor. You know, I told him about what happened. He's like, oh, yeah, that's common. Don't worry about it. Well, I mean... So then I kind of didn't need it. I, I mean, I, I guess this gets to who actually owns that record. The hospital owns it. Is that correct? Well, in, uh, they're providing in I think a service? 48, 49 states uh, where it is determined who owns the record, it, the vast majority is that, that the, the institution owns it. I think in uh, Vermont, uh, they actually say the patient owns it. So for the, for the vast majority, it's either not listed or it's, it's kind of undefined who owns it or the health system owns it. But I think you know, we talk about how it's all distributed all over. You know, our vision is to create a peer-to-peer -peer network that's not owned by any third party that, that can be kind of this health data infrastructure so that people trust it and have hold the keys and allow it to be shared. I wonder, and she, she may want to weigh in on this, if this gets to the part of what needs to be accomplished is just shifting the model. If you're looking at who owns this stuff? How do you? How hard do you have to fight to access it and get it where it's all in one place and store it in a place you're comfortable with? I mean, the way that our medical system has grown up, it's in the hospital's interest to hold on to these records because patients represent somebody, of course, you want to heal, but they also represent the way that hospitals are making money. And if you hold on to their charts, you hold on to the patient. Right. I and mean, can you flip it? How do you flip that around so that hospitals are more invested in just the wellness of a patient in term, instead of getting paid back for each individual test right, that they perform right. and having those records. So, so when I look at ownership of data, I see who is generating the data. So if it's a patient who is generating the data through sensors as a PRO, they have the first right. Um, if the physician is entering the data in a health system and they're doing some imaging and there's interpretation of that, they may own the data. But I think ownership is just one aspect. Mm -hmm. I think what is very important to know whom you can totally share the data or you're obligated to share the data. So even if as a hospital, I may own the data because I have generated the data, if legally I'm obligated to share the data with the patient, then you can co-own the data, right? Data is the most passable currency you can pass from one person to another. You can multiply. That's the whole promise of internet, right? So it doesn't take minuscule amount. It takes minuscule amount of cost to multiply the data when it's in electronic format. So you can both co-own the data if you have generated and share with the patient. And if patient has generated their own data, they can give authorized to their doctor or health system to go on part of the data. So that way both can do the science which they need and what's coming from Apple Research Kit, the patient can then give authority to not only their health system but to the researchers or to the broader community like what's happening in the Precision Medicine Initiative. So the White House and NIH is coming with this Precision Medicine Initiative. They want to create one million cohort of patients who are giving permission to share all their data, and the data will not be housed in one health system. It will be actually made open to all the researchers within that regulations, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I think if we create good uh, kind of regulations on the, the sharing of the data, then it becomes a common commodity for good. And let the best people come in and make more sense of it, and the leverage. If I want to do it for science, I can. If patients want to see a visualization of their promotion, health promotion, and what motivates them, they can use it for that. If they want to do a challenge with their community who runs more, they can do it for that as well. Okay. Ryan, you're nodding. You want to yeah, jump I in mean, on that? Yeah, technology is going to be the thing that enables us to have more control of who you share that data with. I think one thing, when it comes to the paper world of health records or imagery, that's where a lot of the hurdles end up being. But to like you said, uh, it is a violation if they don't give you your records, right? Like you, HIPAA allows you access to all of your records and when you ask for it, it is in the way that they can produce it for you. And of course, they will sometimes ask for a little cost or they'll give it to you on a disk that's unencrypted. But the, the, but, the, but the powerful thing there is not to focus on that it's unencrypted, but the fact that they're going to give it to you and they have to. And so if anyone in this room or anyone who's listening ever gets into a moment where your health record is not given to you, it is your right 
to have your health record. Like HIPAA allows it and actually is the enabler of it. HIPAA is not a, an excuse for it. Um, and then I think when we shift to the things you're, like, like I think what you're doing at Mount Sinai is so far ahead, right? Like you are actually thinking about the fact of co-ownership, the fact that you can share not just between you as an institution and the patient, but then the patient and the larger research community. Tech will enable it, but I would have to also caution as well, like things like meaningful use and regulations will only set the bar. And I keep like putting my hands down here because the bar is you low. know low, right? <laughs> like, and so, you know, when, if I mean, if you're an electronic health record company, if you are a data uh, a place that has a lot of data like a health insurance company, you have opportunities to do more and go above and beyond and to participate in these ways that like you have uh, with the outside companies. Okay. So. We're about to open it up to questions, but I can't let I, that comment on paperwork and how technology will open all of this up. I could not agree with more. My experience this week, I'm perfectly healthy as far as I know, but I've had occasion to be in four doctor's offices this week between my routine eye exam and routine mammogram and my 10-year-old's pediatric you know, annual checkup. And of the four offices, one of them had a computer system at all. I mean, at any of the records. Otherwise, it was these fat manila folders where every year we come in and they keep stapling the pile higher and higher. And I looked at that and I thought, I thought a couple things. You know, one was that this is nuts. I live in DC. It's not some you know, rural backwater. Why on earth are you, can't you pull up when my son's last tetanus shot was? But secondly, that you know, they're, they're doing the thing where they take their notes and then they take it back to the nurse's station and the message is this information is ours and we will share it with you on a need to know basis. And that's, you know, we've been talking about empowering the patient, but there's there's got to be a culture shift in physicians yeah. and medical practices. I would just as well. say um, I think that's that's a great story, and there's this total disconnect between I think the way we all talk about you know all these issues, and then what happens when we go to our own doctor's offices many of the times. And I think that everybody wants to have a different customer service experience with the healthcare system, and I think this issue about getting your patient record or knowing how to get it if you happen to want to get it or just having the lack of it not be an issue, that's that's part of the customer experience that, that you want to have with healthcare. And I still think that when we are, say, selling people health plans, we're, no one is selling anyone a customer experience or associating a brand, you know, maybe Oscar, but aside from that, no one is associating a brand with a particular set of customer experiences, whether it's the ability to access physicians with email or, you know, telemedicine transactions that are efficient versus laborious and tedious, filling out forms on clipboards, all these things that nobody wants to do. And I think that that's sort of what people are waiting for is, you know, decision support is great. It's made a lot of progress, but I still think we're taking, we're taking a fact pattern sort of from a bunch of individual pieces of information about cost sharing and covered benefits, but no one is selling consumers a brand with a promise of a particular customer okay. experience that would include all these things and a lot more. And that's what I think is the, the next thing that needs to happen. Okay. Let me uh, yeah, jump in and then if uh, we'll start getting mics out to people in the audience. I, I just Quick, want to add one response, comment yeah. to it, which is so central to what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. So right now, the backbone of communication between physician to physician is centuries old fax machine. This really? is the backbone of communication. Why? If I have to communicate with any physician, to communicate how his patient is doing or, or I have seen, I only have access to the fax number. That's the backbone. And while we have attention from the federal folks and the challenges, I think we need to change that. Uh, we need to get email, <laughs> and then we'll A move on to A secure messaging apps. platform which uh, should be free for Okay, we have for time for a few quick questions, wow. few brief questions. Uh, lady right here with your hand up in the middle of the room. Okay, so Hi. I'm an economist at the New York Academy of Medicine. Um, and I'm also a professor at, the, at Sinai in population science. Um, so incentives. So there's no incentives right now for um, providers of technology to make their technologies um, compatible. And that makes the decision making for purchasing these technologies really complex. Uh, I'm in a project where I work with cities to sort of evaluate with them um, ways in which they can harness data they're already you know, working with um, to sort of you know improve population health, and it's a mess. And so I guess there are two words that I have, and I think a, a few or maybe all of you will recognize is Cerner and Epic. And so, <laughs> and so, what are your thoughts on that? 
Incentive, yeah. Um, well, as far as the interoperability issue, I, I talked with uh, an executive from a large EHR company uh, just a couple weeks ago, and they feel like the, there's an inevitable trend towards the individual. Um, and we're seeing that realized in, you know, targets and urgent care centers. But we're also seeing that um, the big vendors, you know, they want to keep the customers that want to support those urgent care clinics and those kind of individual, more population, closer to the population kinds of institutions um, uh, viable and, and, and connected. And it, they feel like that is really going to help drive interoperability um, far more than it has been today because right now these big institutions are all competing with each other, but when they have to integrate with a, a, another third institution, that might loosen things up a little bit. Okay. Next, there was a hand up. Uh, yes, uh, right there in the back. Hi, uh, my name's Elaine Chen. I'm with WNYC Radio. Um, we just launched a new health podcast, Only Human. Um, something that we're really excited about is all these apps and really cool ways that patients can get feedback, but something that we're a little worried about since we're not a hospital, we don't, we're not attached to a clinic, is when patient or when our audience, our listeners get this kind of information, maybe like their heart age or how healthy they are or their blood pressure, um, who, who's done the best job in making it so patients understand that information? Because I think something that we're worried about as a media outlet is suppose you're surprised by that outcome and it's a lot worse than you thought. As a radio station, I, I, I can't like talk about it with you and counsel you through it and give you medical advice. Yeah, great question. So I'm question. wondering what app, private apps, not ones that are affiliated with medical institutions have done a really good job in helping users understand their data. It speaks to it. You're getting, you're getting data about your, your personal health and you're not in a room with a doctor who can give you advice on, right. on whether to freak out or not. Right. Um, uh, I think there are many apps which are now coming and we call about it's not just smart apps, it's smart apps with smart teams that really lead to smart outcomes. That's the concept we've, we've learned over the last couple of years, which means many of these apps actually require coaches. So Noom is a, is a very good example, it's based in Noom. NYC and they actually provide health coaches for diabetes and for weight reduction. So, and you know, one of the, I think, central takeaway message in this digital medicine, digital health endeavor is, don't think of health as just being the physician on the other end. We need to create a new healthcare workforce, which is beyond physicians, which are wellness coaches, you know, which are nutritionists, dietitians, fitness people, who can actually make, cover all those aspects. Because if everything comes to a physician and I have to see the patient at the same time, and the incentives are not aligned, I become the bottleneck. Instead of I free it up to all this healthcare workforce. And I think so many of these apps are now have health coaches and that's a proven model. So um, it's I mean it speaks to I guess your whole job in a way is an anomaly. You're working at this, you know, app incubator on the cutting edge of technology, but you're doing it between inside this big old bureaucratic, you know, hospital institution. How does that even work? Yeah, I don't know if my CEO will like it, <laughs> old bureaucratic, but, uh, but they like the second part. Uh, I think we are very lucky with the leadership. They created a horizontal organization, uh, including our CIO when I came in, and they said, we'll become your executive sponsor. You just try to do what you think is the best thing, and we'll try to support you and remove all the barriers, including IT barriers to EHR integration, including uh, the medicine barriers to physician adoption. So that's why my title got very long as mm. a innovation and engagement officer because one of the things they told me was you can't just innovate. You have to engage and improve outcomes. Um, and I would say though we are kind of, we feel we are the cutting edge, there are many hospitals, I would say five or six at least health systems who actually, who actually leadership does not have a conversation why you are doing digital medicine. The conversation has changed to how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a change I have seen just in the last three years. Really? And if you look at the timeline, iPad came in 2010. We're only talking about five years and so much, 165,000 apps in the iTunes and health fitness category, all in the last five years. And leadership doesn't ask any question why. They say how to do telemedicine, how to do secure messaging. So I think the next two, three years, what we call, we call it a post EHR era, we're gonna see a harmonization of patient-centric digital medicine data with the EHR data using fire standards. And I think I want to thank Federal Government Agency for really pushing that, 
both Cerner and Epic are actually building platforms for integration of apps with electronic health tracker data. Squeeze in one more question. Yes, ma'am. Mike's coming around to you. Well, I can just have a big mouth. Um, I hold on, hold on, hold on. She's so close. Here we go. Susan Scooty, um, Medical Daily. Um, I, I'd like to be the voice of skepticism here. Um, it all sounds wonderful, you know, but it's hard to believe that our data, as it becomes increasingly digitalized, as it becomes increasingly invasive, that it won't be, you know, sold off by our trusted institutions um, to private companies wanting to, you know, commercially exploit us at, at the, you know, lowest or at the least scary level and, you know, who knows what else. Also, um, it, it, this moment reminds me, um, you know, this moment reminds me of the moment when uh, we went from most people having uh, pension plans to most people being thrown into 401ks and being thrown into the stock market, um, uh, you know, with the ACA, at the same time that ACA came to pass, um, we are more people are in higher deductible programs, more people are like fending for themselves, uh, you know, in terms of health care and how much they have to pay. We have to figure things out by ourselves, you know, and yet we're sort of swimming in the same waters as, you know, providers who know so much more than us. Okay. And, okay, I think you get my point. Okay, the voice of skepticism has spoken. Ryan, do you want to answer? I think, I mean, being skepti skeptic, about this is actually important, right? Because we need to, because the truth is while everyone in the room raised their hand saying I have access to these records, the fact is it's like you only have pieces of it, right? This is going to be a march. It's a marathon where you have to keep pushing every step of the way. I think we won't be surprised though. It's not gonna happen overnight either. And so I think when it comes to like the trust and protection of our data, we can help companies and institutions uh, along the way understand how to better like create relationships with consumers, right? We're gonna only start trusting apps and services that protect our data. You're gonna start to only, like the FTC is there to be, um, like there's a consumer patient bill of rights. There are certain things that you as a relationship with a consumer and a company have to abide by and the FTC will be there to hold those companies accountable if they like stray. But I think this one here, it will be iterative. These steps that we take will not only push us to share more data, but I think we also have to be iterative to help uh, us um, be more but, transparent. But yeah. let me, Leonard, I'm going to give you the last word, but let me push back. I don't know where you were going, yeah. if, if I'd let you continue, but I mean, you're, you're speaking for the same government that also produces the National Security Agency and that is, you know, looking at all <laughs> forms of data. I'm not saying we're, you know, <laughs> this is, I mean, I cover the national yeah. security world as a reporter and some of these questions are, are yeah big in terms of metadata. My Fitbit is feeding information about whether my heart rate was elevated at a certain time. If I'm accused of murder and I say, no, I wasn't fleeing the crime, is that subpoenable? Can you, ch I mean, there are serious privacy issues being raised from our hospital records, from all of our self-reporting things. How worried should we be? Let's think, end on the I, note I of doom. I, absolutely, you should be very worried because it's, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's already happening. I mean, there's, uh, I don't know how many records of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, the track pharmaceuticals and prescriptions. I mean, everybody has a score of you know how well you 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 track your and take your 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 prescriptions. But then also, I th I think this is the feudal time of health data, um, and and we talk a lot about democracy. Feudal time. Feudal time. Yeah, it's like that we've had we've got our our feudal lords that kind of you know are supposed to protect us, and and we kind of give them the, the fruits of our labor, so to speak. But I think we, the the idea of democratization is is real that we need to. I think, and we, we said so in that paper, demand uh, our health records as a real civil right, and we need to be the ones that, that demand that we have control over how that information is used. But it's up to us. All right, we have to leave it there. Leonard Kesh, uh, principal at Viva Phi. Uh, next to him, we have Ryan Panchadsaran, Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer, Catherine Hempstead of uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Ashisha Treja of Mount Sinai and Sinai App Lab. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Actually, right off here.